It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Let me start by extending my condolences as well and thanks to uh, MPP Daryl Cramp's family. They're here with us today. I'd also like to start by congratulating our Deputy Leader, the MPP from Kuetnang, on a truly historic change to the standing orders. I look forward to hearing him speak in his language more often in this place. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Today, Ontarians will be watching as this government lays out its priorities for the upcoming year. People are looking for hope, uh, for a commitment that things are going to get better. One thing they don't want to see is more of their hard-earned uh, dollars going toward private for-profit health care. Last year, the government doubled funding for private for-profit clinics while public operating rooms were collecting dust. So to the Premier, will you finally properly fund our existing public operating rooms, or are we going to be seeing the government handing over more contracts to for-profit clinics? The Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, the short answer is we have and we will, and we will continue to rebuild our health care system to make sure that people are not languishing in wait, wait lists. Now, when we made a small change in cataract surgery, expanding in four different communities, we now have 17,000 Ontarians who are back at work, back with their families, back in their communities, back reading to their children. Those are the kinds of quantitative changes that are making a difference, that are impacting the lives of Ontario, and I think at 4 o'clock you will see additional exciting news coming from the Minister of Finance. Thank you. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. More funding to private for-profit corporations while our public operating rooms are sitting empty, more emergency rooms closing, millions of pe people losing access to their primary health care. Those are not the priorities of Ontarians. People are looking for reliable health care, for accessible mental health supports, safe, comfortable, long-term, and home care. How can people trust this government to deliver on their health care when they've clearly prioritized private profits over public needs? Minister of Health. You know, Speaker, I remember uh, very distinctly within months of that cataract ex expansion talking to a grandmother in southwestern Ontario, and she was so incredibly pleased that she was able to access that cataract surgery faster as a result of our investments. It made a difference in her life. It made a difference in her family's life. And what people want, Speaker, is to remove themselves from those wait lists and actually get the critical surgery surgery that they need. This is what those investments are doing. This is how we are rebuilding a health care system that, frankly, had been ignored for far too long from the Liberal and the NDP parties of Ontario. We will make that rebuilding. We will continue to make those investments, and we will continue to get it done in the province of Ontario. The final supplementary. Speaker, the truth is that after six long years of this Conservative government, access to health care increasingly is depending on where you live and how much you have in your wallet. So much for their credit, no credit card promise, right? The government's risky privatization experiments aren't just costing people money in extra billing. They're threatening the entire health care system by draining all those public resources in, into private profits. So my question to the Premier is, does he understand that Ontario's economic prosperity depends on a strong public health care system, and can he commit today that not a single health care dollar in the budget is going to go to for-profit health care? Members, will please take their seats. The Minister of Health. Thank you. Perhaps the member opposite should have a conversation with for example, the Ottawa Hospital, who is doing some innovation 
that actually ensures that people get access to surgery faster. It has made a life, literally a life-changing uh, experience for the people of Ottawa who have had access, have been removed from those long-term uh, wait lines for surgery, and making sure that they get access. That's the type of innovation that we are going to encourage. That's the type of innovation that we are seeing coming forward from hospital leaders, from physicians, from surgeons across Ontario who say, I have a better way. We know we can improve the system, and I'm going to embrace that change. We are going to embrace that change. If the NDP want to sit on the sidelines and continue to say no, that's fine, but we're going to get it done in the province of Ontario. Thank you. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. We want innovation, too. We just want it in the public health care system, not something they have to pay for your credit card. Speaker, everybody in this province should have, have access to a family doctor, period. Uh, but under the Conservatives, 2.3 million people in Ontario do not. And that number is expected to rise to 4.4 million. That's, that's a quarter of Ontario's population by 2026. That means more people without regular checkups, more people missing a chance for early diagnosis and just putting up with pain and discomfort. And instead of dealing with this, this government said no to our proposal to fund health teams and shared administrative support to get more people in, in front of a doctor. So my question to the Premier is, will we see a change in approach in today's budget or will it just offer more of the same? Health. Speaker, where was this party when we announced a $110 million expansion of primary care multidisciplinary teams? They were silent. They would prefer to bring forward motions that talk about ensuring that we have more administrative staff. We are laser focused on making sure that we have sufficient health human resources whether those are expanded seats in two new medical schools in the province of Ontario, City of Brampton, City of Scarborough, where we are seeing expansions of medical residency seats in Northern Ontario School of Medicine, over 100 new seats. And I may say, Speaker, that the numbers show that while your government was in part in in uh, government for a very short period of time, you actually cut residency seats in the province of Ontario, as did the Liberals when they were in government. We are the party that is rebuilding our health care system, whether it is through expansions in education, opportunities for people to join multidisciplinary teams. And Thank you. Remind the members to make their comments through the chair. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Ontarians feel like they're being left behind, right? Hundreds of complaints have been made about extra billing uh, by these, four pro these profiteering health care companies. Uh, the government won't disclose the bad actors that are gouging people in need. And then every day we're seeing more of these ads popping up in subways, you know, on billboards. Uh, demanding pricey subscriptions, health services that can cost people thousands and thousands of dollars of e a year just to access the most basic of care. So, Speaker, I want to know if this is how the Premier sees the future of this province. Is it going to be like Netflix for health care? Are we going to have to subscribe to have basic health care needs met? Thank you, Speaker. Minister of Health. Speaker, Every single day in the province of Ontario, we have 600,000 people interacting with our OHIP-funded public-funded services. Those are people who are accessing primary care physicians. Those are people who are getting needed and necessary surgeries, whether it is in our operating rooms, whether it is in community diagnostic centres. Those are people who are getting the service they need and deserve in the province of Ontario. Can we do more? Absolutely. But I want to be clear, Ontario leads Canada, and we will continue to make those investments to ensure that we continue to lead Canada in all access to health care services, including, of course, primary care multidisciplinary teams, which are the backbone of our health care system. Thank you, Speaker. Final supplementary. Speaker, 600,000 women are waiting for mammograms in Ontario right now. 600,000. One billion dollars has been hemorrhaged out of our health care system and spent on private agency nursing companies. 
People deserve oh, billion, one billion. Speaker, people deserve to get health care that's close to home and available when they need it. Instead, that is that they are seeing their rural emergency rooms close. 600,000 women can't get mammograms. It is not the reality in Ontario anymore. The Liberals, they opened the door to the privatization of health care in this province. We watched it. We saw what was happening, and we fought it. But this government, this Conservative government, is doubling down and throwing the doors wide open. So Ontarians want to know today, in this budget, is it going to be more than the, of the same? Or can they count on this government to protect their public, not-for-profit health care system in the province of Ontario? Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. The member opposite refers to mammograms, a, uh, an investment, of course, you may have missed, that we have actually increased the access to mammograms for the women in Ontario. You continue to vote against these investments. Order. You continue to say that we have not done the things that you vote against every single time we bring it forward. In this year, we will have women who have access to mammograms who are 40 and above, a change that our government made under the leadership of Premier Ford. And the, the NDP, the Liberals, continue to say that we have not done enough. I want to continue to invest in our publicly funded system. It is unfortunate that we do not have opposition members who understand how critically important this is Response. to the people of Ontario. And once again, I'll remind the members to make their comments to the chair, please. The next question, the member for University Rosedale. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. The Conservatives are on track to lose $357 million in federal funding because this government is failing to meet its own affordable housing targets. This government has two choices. Submit a credible plan to the federal government to build more affordable housing by Friday, or explain to Ontarians how this government plans to account for the loss of $357 million earmarked for affordable housing in this year's budget. Which choice are you going to make? Again, I'll ask the members to make their comments through the chair. You, government House Leader. The choice that we made is to overachieve our targets by 170 per cent when it comes to uh, renovating uh, and upgrading old, uh, old housing stock. The choice that we have made is to ensure that we're at 60 per cent of the target uh, uh, that we were asked to achieve. What is happening, Mr. Speaker, is that the federal government, the federal Liberal government supported by the NDP, is unilaterally cutting funding to the province of Ontario of over $357 million, on top of the $400 million that they have already shortchanged the people of the province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. Our municipal partners agree with us that this is a unilateral cut by the federal government. We remain at the Order. table, Mr. Speaker. We are not going to make up Order. some program because the federal government and the, Lib the Liberal and NDP have decided to change the goalposts. We meet a target, they change the goalposts. What Order. this is, Mr. Speaker, is Response. an immature federal government doing what they do best, pitting one region of the country against another. They're treating Ontario differently than every other province. We won't stand for it, Mr. Speaker. We'll continue to make investments in our right to— Supplementary question. Once again, the member for University Rosedale. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. Of all the provinces and territories, the Conservatives are dead last <laughs> in building affordable go. housing. Dead last. Experts are telling you very clearly what is needed to build more affordable housing, from permitting inclusionary zoning to funding community housing to coming up with a good definition of affordable housing that we've waited two years. You haven't even come up with a definition of affordable housing. Yeah. Premier, can you commit to submitting a better housing action plan? Plan by Friday, so we don't miss out on this federal money. Yeah. Members will take their seats. Once again, I'll ask the members to make their comments through the chair. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Shows you, shows you where the NDP are. We actually passed the definition of affordable housing months ago, Mr. Speaker, with the support of the NDP, unanimous support of everybody in the entire House. So we'll keep on going, Mr. Order. Speaker. But what is happening here, Mr. Speaker, is Order. classic Liberal and NDP, right? Because we are meeting our targets, 170 per cent 
of the target. Because we are meeting the target, 60 per cent of the target on way, we're still months, years away from having to hit the 100 per cent mark. We're crashing through those targets for the people of the province of Ontario. What they're doing is pitting one region against another region, Mr. Speaker. Order. We saw it with the carbon tax. We're seeing Order. it in housing. And you know who can make help make a difference? It is the NDP in Ottawa who hold the balance Opposition of power. Order. Instead of supporting a $700 million Response. unilateral cut to the province of Ontario, take down an immature government that pits one region against another. The official opposition will come to order. Order. The next question, the member for Windsor to come see. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Minister of Finance. Uh, across the world, economic challenges continue to grow. And we know that Ontario is not isolated from this geopolitical uncertainty. We are not. Families, workers, and businesses in my riding, Windsor to come see, and throughout Ontario are feeling the financial pressures that have been caused by ongoing supply chain disruptions, inflation, and high interest rates. And with the federal Liberals proposing with a scheduled 23 per cent carbon tax hike next week, oh. Ontarians oh, are looking to our hurt. government for much-needed support to make life more affordable. Speaker, we know the people of Ontario need and deserve more relief. That's why our government must continue to demonstrate through legislation, investments and other initiatives that more financial support will be provided to Ontarians and that we have a strong plan for the future. Speaker, can the minister please tell this House how our government is keeping costs down and putting money back in the pockets of the people of Ontario? Parliamentary assistant and member for Oakville. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you to the great hardworking member from Windsor Tecumseh. Members of the Legislature, today is Budget Day. This is a big day. We are excited about rebuilding Ontario, continuing that path, and to make life more affordable for the people of Ontario. Speaker, just yesterday, under Premier Ford, our government announced an extension of the gas tax cut, now saving the average household $320 per year. Yeah. <laughs> Speaker, this represents the largest tax cut this century in Ontario. Wow. And yet, Speaker, while we are cutting taxes and putting money back in the pockets of the people of Ontario, the federal Liberal Party is set to implement a 23 per cent oh. tax hike on the carbon tax in less than one week. Shame. The Liberal plan to tackle affordability, Speaker, is to make life more expensive for the people of Ontario and Canada. That's why Spons. we continue to call for scrap the tax and stand with our government as we make life more affordable for the people of Ontario. Great answer. Supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Speaker, and uh, thank you to the parliamentary assistant for uh, that response. Uh, it's great to hear that our government is consistently introducing measures that will provide real financial relief for Ontarians. Here, here. I know the people in my riding will be thrilled to hear that we are extending the gas tax cut. Obviously, we're the automotive capital of Canada, and they look forward to seeing our government continue to find more ways to reduce costs and make life more affordable. That's why we must continue to show leadership and demonstrate a strong economic vision that will help families during this challenging time. Unlike the members opposite who refuse to stand up for Ontarians on this carbon tax, our government must remain committed to investing in what matters to most people as we build for a stronger future. Speaker, can the parliamentary assistant please explain what our government is doing to help Ontarians during these challenging economic times? Well said. <laughs> parliamentary assistant, the Minister of Finance, Member for Oakville. Thank you again, Speaker, and thank you to the, again to the great member from Windsor to come see. Speaker, I'm proud to say that in just a few hours, our government will deliver the 2024 budget, our plan to build a better Ontario. And Speaker, even for my great colleague, the member, I know we can't reveal too many details just yet, but what I can say is our government has a plan. It has a plan that supports Ontarians through these difficult times of high inflation and high Bank of Canada interest rates. And it's a plan that will help keep costs down. This is a budget that will continue our government's plan to build up our province without raising taxes on the people of Ontario. Here, here, here. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Kiwetanong. Uh, miigwech, uh, Speaker. Uh, on April 1st, 
uh, the long delayed uh, Community Safety and Policing Act will come into force. Under the CSPA, First Nation laws are exempt from being enforced. The Chief of uh, the United uh, Chiefs and Councils of Manitoulin and Anishinaabe Police told us last week that criminal behavior on reserve has gotten worse while Ontario delays and changes needed to enforce laws on reserve. Speaker, um, fixing it will only take a simple amendment. Will the Premier commit to making that amendment immediately? Thank you. In reply, the Solicitor General. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member for the question. The Community Safety and Policing Act, which will come live on April 1st, replaces a piece of legislation that's 35 years old. And under both the old Act, the Police Services Act, and the Community Safety Policing Act, police can enforce municipal and First Nations bylaws equally. Our government, as the member knows, takes public safety very seriously, especially all over Ontario. But, Mr. Speaker, I want to say, I want to say one other, uh, one other uh, word. Thanks to the Chiefs of Ontario, who made a suggestion to establish a collaborative table under the Ministry of the Attorney General, we did just that. The collaborative table is an excellent, is an excellent table to table ideas for us to consider, and that's exactly why it exists. Mr. Speaker, we take public safety seriously all across Ontario. The supplementary question. Uh, Speaker, uh, First Nations uh, came to Queen's Park last week uh, to work with the government, uh, the Attorney General and the Solicitor General uh, couldn't be bothered to meet with the leadership. Shameful. The Ontario Regional Chief said after his meeting with government members, we didn't hear any commitments to reach a timely resolution. April 1 is six days away, Speaker. Will the government work with the chiefs and amend the Community Safety and Policing Act? Members, please take their seats. Solicitor General. Well, thanks, Mr. Speaker. You know, First Nations communities are encouraged to work collaboratively with their local police service to determine what enforcement options are best for them. And the provincial and federal government, as the, as the member knows opposite, do not direct any police services in Ontario. Mr. Speaker, just two weeks ago, I was at the Ontario Police College. This was my sixth March pass ceremony, and I made a point of meeting with all of the cadets that are going to First Nation police services. It was over two dozen. Mr. Speaker, we take public safety in the four corners of Ontario very seriously, and that's exactly why the Community Safety and Policing Act that will come live on April 1st will provide an unparalleled opportunity for communities all across Ontario to feel that the legislation brings Response. them up to the times that they're in. And one more thing, Mr. Speaker, it is very important to know that I stay in regular contact with the police chiefs on a regular basis, including those serving First Nations communities. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Newmarket, Aurora. Thank you, Speaker. And my question is for the Minister of Energy. Oh. Families in my great riding of Newmarket, Aurora, are concerned about the ever rising cost of living. That's right. They are paying more for everything, from their energy bills to grocery uh, prices. And, Speaker, the carbon tax is only making things worse. That's right. While our government continues to advocate and fight for Ontarians, the federal government continues to disregard the people's concerns by ruling out any future pauses or exemptions on this carbon tax. Speaker, that's unfair to Ontarians who work hard to make a living to raise a family and to support their young children and their aging parents. But despite the affordability struggles many people in our province are facing, the NDP and the Liberal members opposite continue to remain silent. It's shameful. 
that they refuse to join us in calling for the elimination of this disastrous tax. That's right. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. And the Minister of Energy may reply. Speaker, we're five days away from the federal carbon tax increasing by a massive 23 per cent. It is Groundhog Day for the Liberals because every April 1st, they're making it more expensive for the people across Canada and here in Ontario when it comes to paying for gas groceries and delivery of vehicles for farmers to grow the crops. and The Queen of the Carbon Tax, Bonnie Crombie, and the Liberal Caucus here, as a matter of fact, just appointed their new candidate for the Milton by-election, who's on the record supporting the federal carbon tax. Mr. Speaker, I know it, it's shocking, and Bonnie Crombie was out last week announcing the new hand-picked members for her advisory committee. Kathleen Wynne's Environment Order. Minister Chris Ballard helped design the Liberal Order. $50 billion cap-and-trade program. He's on the committee, and before being voted out by rural voters, by, by well, this this uh, giant slayer right here, Lisa Thompson, the new agriculture minister, voted Carol Mitchell out, and uh, she wanted to impose a carbon tax on farmers, and she was the agriculture minister, oh. Mr. Speaker. Oh. Let's scrap the tax while we. Have the supplementary question back to the member for Newmarket Aurora. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for his response. People's household budgets are being stretched thin as the carbon tax drives up the cost of daily necessities like food, home heating, and transportation. Our government has shown time and time again that we do not need the carbon tax to cut emissions. Unlike the previous Liberal government, which oversaw skyrocketing electricity rates that force families into energy poverty, we have made energy more affordable so Ontario families do not have to choose between paying their electricity bills and putting food on the table. Yeah. While the carbon tax, Bonnie Crombie and her minivan caucus continue to work against Question. us, we will not stop getting it done for the people of here, Ontario. Here. Speaker, can the minister please explain what our sure government did. is doing to counter <laughs> the impacts of the costly Liberal and N Thank you. Thank you very much. The Minister of Energy. Speaker, uh, thanks to the member opposite, we're taking a common sense approach in ensuring that energy and electricity prices are affordable in the province of Ontario, something that those in the Liberal caucus and even the NDP caucus really don't understand, Mr. Speaker. It's because we have brought that stability to energy prices in Ontario that we're seeing our economy grow. Now, Bonnie Crombie, the queen of the carbon tax, and her Liberal caucus are telling the people of Ontario that we're better off with this federal tax. And as a matter of fact, the federal environment minister said last week that Bonnie Crombie was happy to have the federal increase on carbon taxes. A whopping 23 per cent, Mr. Order. Speaker, that's going to happen in five days from today when we're in the midst of an affordability and a cost of living crisis in Ontario. It's completely unacceptable that Bonnie Crombie and her cast of Liberals are supporting this expensive tax that's driving up the cost of everything in our province, Mr. Speaker. It's time to do the right thing. It's time to scrap this tax. Question. The member for Toronto Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Opsu Sepfo Local 5115 workers, the frontline workers of the Region Park Community Health Centre, are on strike for fair wages. This government is starving public health care. Their wages were frozen by Bill 124 during an affordability crisis, Speaker. These healthcare professionals are doing some of the most difficult work in this province, literally at the epic center of a poison drug supply and opiate overdose crisis. Despite all of this, they continue to show up for our communities doing that hard work. Will this government show up for them in today's budget and fund public health care so that they can get back to work and receive the fair wage that they deserve? The Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, while I'm obviously not going to talk about a specific labor relations that is happening, I will say that public health units have had a 16 percent increase since 2018 when we formed government, and that is, of course, outside of all of the investments that we made sure were in place for our public health units to um, protect 
the people of Ontario during the pandemic and obviously um, making sure distributing the vaccines to people to keep them safe. I will say you no, know, a 16 percent increase for public health units across Ontario is unprecedented. Of course, in the last uh, Association of Municipalities, we also made a commitment and shared with our municipal partners that a 1 percent increase was part of our plan to invest in public health in the, in the province of Ontario. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the member for Toronto Centre. Yes, thank you very much, Speaker. And back to the Premier. Political messaging will only get you so far. That spin is not being believed by anyone. The people who agree with you, the only people that agree with you, are private health care investors who are looking to gut our public health care system. Real, honest Ontarians like Kirsty Millwood, who actually is in the chambers today to listen to this debate, is a frontline foot health worker and the president of OPSU. Acepfo Local 5115, and she tells me, we need funding for community health care centres. We need to provide criti critical services. We keep people out of the hospitals. We save lives daily. We lost so much because of Bill 124, Speaker, but they continue to show up for work. Now it's the time for the government to stop forcing them out of their jobs because they are living with unlivable wages. Will this government properly fund community health care centres at the health care rate of inflation? Minister of Health. Thank you. You know, 16 percent increase since 2018. And where was this party? They voted against every single one of those investments, whether it was fall economic statement, ec estimates or budgets. You always vote against the investments we make in the province of Ontario. The $110 million investment in primary Order. care multidisciplinary teams <laughs> does, in fact, include community health centres, and they do get an increase in their annual operating budget. Why, Speaker? Because we see the value in the multidisciplinary teams. Why do we continue to expand primary care in the province of Ontario? Because we see the value in making sure that we have a stable health care force that is connected to the people in our communities. We'll continue to make those investments, rebuild the province of Ontario in our health care system, and the people of Ontario will watch who votes in support of those investments. Then I'll remind the members to make their comments through the chair. The next question, the member for Beaches, East York. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The dream of home ownership in Ontario, <clears throat> excuse me, the dream of home ownership in Ontario is no longer a dream for young people and families. It has become a nightmare under this government. Speaker, they claim they are the government of yes. To quote the government members in this House, the Minister of Housing, we're trying to end NIMBYism. The, minister, the member from Brampton North, NIMBYism is one of the most dangerous forces in our politics today. The former Minister of Housing, we're, we've gone past NIMBYism. I think we've now in bananaism, built absolutely nothing anywhere near anyone. But as we found out, they are the government of no, not in my backyard, and built absolutely nothing near anyone anywhere. Question. My question is, when did this government decide to make like a banana and split on building housing for the people of Ontario? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Oh, Speaker. <laughs> it's true. Where, where, where do you start with a question like that, Mr. Speaker? So let, let's get this straight. So the Liberal Order. leader, the Liberal leader who takes one position one day, another position the next day, one position one day, another position the next day, it's like one of those weather vanes in a hurricane. You never know which way they're going. You know what the reality is? We made the decision to work with our municipal partners, and you know what they told us? The number one obstacle to building homes, the number one obstacle to building homes is the infrastructure deficit that was left behind by the previous Liberal government. They said that because of the infrastructure deficit, there's not enough sewer and water in the ground to build millions of homes, and that is why Liberals advocate for policies that will build hundreds of homes. Well, we want to build 
millions of homes, Mr. Speaker, and we are not ashamed to work with our partners to put infrastructure on the ground to build millions of homes so that everybody can have the dream of home ownership. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Why doesn't this government talk about my track record on housing? Because, because it's better than theirs and they know it. I am MPP Yimby. The people Order. of Beaches East York put me here to represent them because they know I get can get it done. Meanwhile, the Premier and the head of Provincial Housing Supply Action Team are dead set against get gentle density that will help Ontario get on track with the housing crisis. They are losing out on crucial federal funding because they refuse to be bold and lead the charge on allowing fourplexes. The legacy of the government will be one of nimbyism. But it's not too late to change course. You can even borrow the Ontario Liberal Housing Bill. We've done the work for you. Start with fourplexes and start now. Order. Question. Speaker, my question is, when will this government actually get the shovels in the ground instead of leaving them on the shelf in home hardware? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. If I was to borrow, if I was to borrow Bonnie Crombie's housing plan, Mr. Speaker, I would have the massive record that she had as the mayor of Mississauga, right? The one we saw. The population of Mississauga actually decreased when the population of the province was exploding. In fact, in her last months in office, she had a massive start of 12 homes in her community. So thank you very much. I don't think this caucus here wants to borrow anything from that small group of individuals over there who for 15 years stood in the way of building homes. And you know who agrees with me? Is the former Liberal cabinet minister who testified at one of our hearings and said that the crisis started under the Liberal watch, Mr. Response. Speaker. So what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to put infrastructure in the ground, and I'm going to make sure that we build millions of homes instead of the hundreds that they would like to build. The next question, the member for Essex. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. The people of Ontario are tired of Liberal tax hikes. They remember what the province was like under the previous Liberal government when it was hiking taxes at every opportunity. Businesses fled the province in droves, and workers' hard-earned paychecks shrunk, and the future of Ontario's economy looked bleak. Our government came in and reversed course. We know that lowering taxes and reducing costs are the keys to prosperity for our workers and for our businesses. That's why we're calling on the federal Liberals to stop their carbon tax hike of April the 1st. Speaker, can the minister highlight what we've done to lower costs across the board so that the federal Liberals can learn from our example? To reply, the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Speaker, look, we have shown the Liberals the way, shown the Liberals that cutting red tape and lowering taxes are the keys to creating growth and jobs in Ontario. Eleven red tape reduction bills, nearly a billion dollars in cost savings, 500 unnecessary pieces of red tape reduced, all voted against by the Liberals and the NDP. 10% Ontario-made manufacturing investment tax credit, $2 million in savings per business per year, voted against by the Liberals and the NDP. The gas tax reduction, 11 cents a litre, voted against by the Liberals and the NDP. Speaker, that's how you get 700,000 jobs created, by lowering taxes and cutting costs. Response. Listen to the people of Ontario. Scrap the tax today. Supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, I thank the minister for that response. 
We can't just stand around and watch as the Trudeau Liberals hike yet another tax. We've encouraged the Liberals in this House to call on their federal counterparts to stop the April 1st tax hike. But instead, Bonnie Crombie couldn't be bothered, saying she's not there to tell the federal government how to do their job. Speaker, it just goes to show you that even with a new leader, the Liberals have not changed, not one bit. They'll watch as Prime Minister Trudeau hikes the carbon tax again, even though they know it punishes businesses and households across Ontario. Speaker, can the minister please tell the Liberals how lowering costs creates growth and new investment across our economy? Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Speaker, the Liberals need to get their hands out of the pockets of Ontario's businesses and workers. And again, we've shown them the way. Although they voted against every one of these, the child care tax credit, families can claim 75% of their eligible child care expenses, low income workers tax credit, tax credit to reduce or eliminate your Ontario personal income tax, guaranteed annual income system. We not only increased the eligibility, we doubled the payments in 2023 for our seniors. And last year, that has helped to create 180,000 jobs in Ontario, $11 billion in foreign direct investment, which alone created 12,000 jobs. We've shown the Liberals Response. the way. Lower taxes, cutting red tape. That's how you create jobs, not by bringing in a carbon tax. Next question, the member for Ottawa West, Rupiah. Thank you, Speaker. Staffing shortages are having a severe impact on our schools, robbing our children of the supports they need to learn, to be safe, and in some cases, to even be at school. As one Ontario principal says, quote, we are not staffed properly to support students. We can only respond to emergencies. The Minister of Education has been frantically pointing fingers in every direction instead of taking responsibility and coming up with a plan to fix it. Where's the plan, Speaker? Will we finally see it in today's budget? Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, what you will see in today's budget is a continued commitment to public education with a commitment to build schools, to invest in back to basics, on literacy and math, and improving standards in Ontario's publicly funded schools. That is the cornerstone of our plan to get back to basics and to create pathways to good paying jobs for our young people. Speaker, if the members opposite want to be constructive, if they're concerned about uh, absences within schools that impact quality education, then they will stand up to their union friends and insist that retired educators are permitted to be in classrooms Order. where they belong Order. instead of unqualified, uh, and unqualified staff in front of teachers. It order. makes no sense that the NDP opposition come to order. It makes no sense that the NDP would rather unqualified staff in front of, instead of a qualified, merited teacher leading education on Ontario's publicly funded schools. Response. Why don't they stand up for children? Stand up for the right to learn of every child in this province. I didn't hear a plan there, Speaker, just more buck passing. We have over 40,000 teachers who are qualified, certified, and in good standing with the Ontario Teachers College who are choosing not to teach in our schools because of this minister's policies. Meanwhile, we have an attendance problem in high schools because why bother going to school if you're not going to learn anything today? And more than half of principals say they've asked parents to keep their children with special needs home. This is serious, Speaker, and it deserves a better response than finger-pointing from this minister. So I repeat, will we see a plan to address staffing shortages in today's budget? Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, BC Global News reports the union warns, quote, union warns of growing burnout, reliance of, uns of uncertified teachers amid BC staffing crunch. In the New Democratic Province of BC, the UNESCO reports, quote, 
The world is facing a significant teacher shortage. Even with challenges in the Federation that precede our government, we have a plan. It's why we cut certification by half. It's why we ensured 3,000 more educators are in our schools today. It's why we revoked Regulation 274 to allow speed and qualification to try for the hiring of new educators. Unlike provinces east and west that have significant shortages that are plaguing the continuity of learning, we have gone ahead of this, and we're committed to going even further in partnership with the Minister of Finance to invest in quality learning, to raise standards and ambitions, to give hope and economic opportunity to young people when they graduate. Spons. They can get a good job and achieve the dream of this country. The next question, the member for Algoma Manitoulin. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Before the March break, in a brief elevator conversation, the Minister and I had a discussion about what our plans were when we'd be going back home for the March break. Part of my plan was going to continue the ongoing tour that I've been doing in lumber mills forestry operations across northern Ontario. Well, Minister, the report card is in. Do you think you received a passing grade? <laughs> Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. That's, a That's quite a question. Uh, you know what? Uh, in talking with the forestry sector throughout Ontario, talking with mayors, talking with people all throughout the sector, I think we are getting a passing grade. You know, we are making investments in the sector that are unprecedented. And I'd highlight the recent announcement of $60 million to support our biomass plan. $60 million to drive innovation, to drive the future of forestry in Ontario. Make sure that there are opportunities not only today, but tomorrow. And, Speaker, we will continue to drive that innovation. We will continue to work with our forestry partners. We will continue to make sure that Northern Ontario thrives, grows, and is part of the great economy right here in Ontario. The supplementary question. Once again, to the minister. Minister, there's a saying, if a tree falls in a forest, does anybody hear? Minister, it's time to listen. If I had to grade the minister's effort, he'd get an F. Why? Because you failed to contact the mills that relied on Espanola and Terrace Bay. You have failed to contact the forest operators that feed the mills. You have failed to contact the trucking operators who deliver the wood, the chips, the paper. Minister, the silence in the forest is deafening. The mills, the truckers, the operators have been waiting a long time. The entire industry has asked for a gathering of minds to address this crisis. Minister, the doors are open, they're waiting for your call, and they welcome you any time. Question. Do your homework, Minister. Your words don't match your actions. Make the calls. Remind the members to make their comments through the chair. Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Absolutely astounding to me that the member opposite would stand up and say that. They had years to support a Liberal government that made no investments in the forestry sector. They did not push them at all. They did not make sure that forestry was a significant part of the economy here in Ontario. But we are every single day, Mr. Speaker. We are talking with the bill operators. We are talking with the forestry operators. We are making sure that we're making critical investments in the North. We'll continue to do that because this is the only government that recognizes the value of the North. We've heard time and time again, time and time again, that the North is referred to as a no-man's land by the previous government. Right. Well, this government knows the opportunity that lays within the North. This government is working with the forestry sector. This government is working with sectors all throughout Northern Ontario to drive economies, that, make cool. sure that people that have spots. prosperity, make sure that we can integrate the okay, economy in the North right. with the economy in the South and have a strong, prosperous Ontario. I make no apologies for the efforts that we have made in Northern Ontario and will continue to. Thank you. The next question, the member for Etobicoke Lakeshore. Mr. Speaker, and my question is to the uh, Minister of Energy. Do you know, Mr. Speaker, the carbon tax is making life difficult for the people of Ontario at a time when many Ontarians are already stretching their household budgets to heat their homes. They should not be forced to choose between feeding themselves or staying warm during those cold winter nights. But, Speaker, the federal government 
and the queen of the carbon tax, Bonnie Crombie, continue to ignore the harmful impacts of the carbon tax. And with another hike scheduled next week, the Liberal members in this House are still refusing to speak up on behalf of their constituents. Unlike the Liberal leader who raised taxes every single year as Mayor of Mississauga, our government, under the leadership of the Premier, have been advocating for the people of this province since day one. Question. And we will not stop until the federal Liberals finally scrap this tax. Speaker, can the Minister of Energy tell this House how the federal carbon tax is driving the cost up of everything? Minister of Energy. Indeed, uh, Speaker, driving up the cost of everything across Ontario and parts of Canada where the federal government keeps the carbon tax in place, Mr. Speaker. But what's really astounding, I think, to a lot of people is just the silence or even quiet support of the federal government's carbon price, carbon tax, from the queen of the carbon tax, uh, Bonnie Crombie, in Ontario. As a matter of fact, you know, she's put together a climate panel that's made up of supporters of the federal carbon tax. And as a matter of fact, the provincial Liberals in Milton just announced their candidate for the upcoming by-election in Milton. Guess where the candidate stands on the federal carbon tax? Fully, fully supportive. Fully supportive, Mr. Speaker. Now, the carbon tax is driving up the cost of everything. It's hurting Liberal numbers here in Ontario, so we can fully understand why the queen of the carbon tax, Bonnie Crombie, isn't putting her name Response. on the ballot in Milton, because Liberals across Canada, including here in Ontario, are facing certain defeat because of the carbon tax that's making life more unaffordable. People. Supplementary question. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the minister for that answer. You know, it is very unfortunate to see the federal gov government intentionally disregarding the welfare of most Ontarians, and they're blatantly ignoring how the carbon tax, tax is leading to increase in, in energy costs. But, Speaker, most most concerning thing is that it's only going to get worse. The federal Liberals and the Queen of the Carbon Tax, Bonnie Crombie, want to keep raising the carbon tax every single year. That means higher costs for groceries, higher costs for gas, higher costs for home heating and other essentials on April 1st every single year. Only our government, under the leadership of this Premier, has been standing up for Ontarians and calling on the federal government to scrap the carbon tax. Speaker, can the minister please explain why Ontario families Question. cannot afford the carbon tax increase that Bonnie Crombie Liberals are supporting? Minister of Energy. Sadly, Speaker, my colleague isn't wrong. The Prime Minister is going to increase the carbon tax again five days from now on April the 1st. And the Prime Minister has the full support of Bonnie Crombie, but that shouldn't, shouldn't be a surprise because the queen of the carbon tax was there when Stefan Dion was the Liberal leader in Ottawa and a part of that cabinet, or that caucus, I should say, that was in support of Stéphane Dion's climate, climate pricing, carbon pricing uh, tactic, the green shift. Uh, this was unbelievable, Mr. Speaker, that this caucus, this Liberal caucus, is fully supportive of a tax that is making life more unaffordable in the middle of a cost-of-living crisis that in five days is going to go up again. Mr. Speaker, the new candidate for the Liberals in Milton is supportive of the federal carbon tax. The provincial Liberal caucus Response. is supportive of the federal Liberal carbon tax. Bonnie Crombie and the Ontario Liberals are supportive of the carbon tax. Bonnie Crombie and the Liberals will— Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Hamilton North. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Many times in this House, New Democrats have called on this government to raise Ontario Works and Ontario Disability Support Program rates to an amount that will bring people out of legislated poverty. Our constituents are struggling to pay the rent, and they're left with little to nothing for anything else like food or utilities. Speaker, can the Premier tell me, will today's budget finally support Ontarians and make OW and ODSP rates livable for people of Ontario? Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you very much, Speaker, and I thank my uh, colleague for the question. Mr. Speaker, I will tell you, no government in the history has stood up for Ontarians than this government, Mr. Speaker. When we raised 
the Ontario Disability Support Program by 5 per cent, Mr. Speaker, tied that to inflation and as a result saw an increase of an additional 6.5 per cent, Mr. Speaker. The opposition was not supportive of that. Mr. Speaker, we went a step above and beyond that. We removed and changed the income to earn income threshold from $200 to $1,000 so that people can earn more income, Mr. Speaker. And we're seeing the results. Now, the opposition, Mr. Speaker, unfortunately, has not supported any of these initiatives to help Ontarians. At a time when life is unaffordable, you have heard time and time again, Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Energy, every single member on this side, get up, stand Response. up in their seat and say, stand up for Ontarians. Your counterparts in Ottawa control. They, they are able to make sure that they wipe the federal counterpart tax and make life more affordable for Thank you. Again, last members to make their comments to the, chair, to the chair, rather. Supplementary. Listening to this minister makes me so angry to know how many people are suffering, are suffering each and every day Order. on our streets. People have to line up at food banks month Stand after month. Many are struggling with additional barriers, like living below standard housing. ODSP recipients can't live in loving relationships under the same roof for fear of clawbacks or being cut off from any funds altogether due to their cruel legislation. So back to the Premier. Will this year's budget provide real, meaningful benefits for people of OW and ODSP and end the punitive clawbacks? Members, please take their seats. Order. Order. Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Here, what should make this member and every member across upset is when they failed the people of Ontario, when they held the balance of power here for years after year after year. Now, my suggestion again to the member is real. You hold the balance of power in Ottawa. Call your colleagues. Make sure that they remove the increase on April 1st. Mr. Speaker, order. here in Ontario, as I mentioned, to you, come we to will order. always stand up for every Ontarian, which is why we increased order. the Ontario's Disability Support Program by 5 per cent. That support, Mr. Speaker, was increased order. by an additional 6.5 per cent to a total of 12 per cent in less than one year, Mr. Speaker. Also, the earned income threshold was, was changed from 200 from earning $200 to $1,000 so that those to who can and are able Response. to contribute. There are over 200,000 jobs that are not being filled in this province, Mr. Speaker. We want Ontarians to have more money in their pocket. Thank you. Thank you. The minister will take his seat. The next question, the member for Carlton. The member for Carleton. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Long-Term Care. The carbon tax is increasing the price of everything in our province. This includes the cost of building materials and transport. Speaker, I've spoken to operators who have expressed concern over the rising costs of building new long-term care homes. They're worried that the carbon tax will only escalate those costs. We need to keep building these homes so Ontario seniors can stay in the communities they helped build close to their loved ones. Speaker, can the minister please tell this House what our government is doing to protect Ontario families, especially our seniors, from the negative impact of the carbon tax? Thank you. The minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker. I remember visiting uh, Osgood Care Centre in that member's riding and listening to the seniors, the operators, the hard-working frontline health care workers, and they're saying the same thing. Uh, that costs have gone up a lot, and that's affecting how they give care to our seniors. So let's give another example. In Barrie, the municipality has informed me that it uh, must create a 13 per cent contingency fund due to rising costs. Uh, Sault Ste. Marie, building costs have gone up by $20 million in just four years. Speaker, it's in every corner of this province that we are seeing costs explode thanks to this Liberal carbon tax, which is about to go up again in a time of high inflation and such economic uncertainty. It's why our government introduced the construction funding subsidy to help the sector under the leadership of the, the great former uh, Minister of Long-Term Care. But, Speaker, we call on the Liberals who are there or here in this legislature to call their federal counterparts and say this is not the right 
thing to do. This is not fair on the backs of Spons. seniors. Speaker, our seniors took care of us. We need to take care of them. Let's get rid of this unfair tax. Yes. Right. A supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and through you, thank you to the Minister for his response and especially for taking the, the time to come and visit the Osgood Care Centre with me. Unlike the opposition, NDP and Liberals, our government is working hard to address the challenges Ontarians are facing. We know that the carbon tax is increasing the price of everything in our province. That's why we've been asking the federal government to scrap this tax since day one. But, Speaker, the opposition continues to ignore their constituents and support a regressive tax that only harms Ontario families. Our government must continue to ensure that our seniors receive the care that they need and enjoy the high quality of life they deserve in a long-term care home like the Osgood Care Centre and across the province. Speaker, can the minister please further explain the effect the federal carbon tax is having on Ontario's long-term care sector? Thank you. A very legitimate question, Speaker. Some really grave concerns there, because frankly, Speaker, these, this is the concern uh, in every corner of the province when we travel from long-term care home to long-term care home, because it's not just affecting the cost of food and heating. It's causing the effect of absolutely everything, and it's no surprise that the queen of the carbon tax, Bonnie Crombie, and the Liberals won't even talk about their support for the Liberal tax. It's not just one tax either, is it, Speaker? It is a tax on the tax. The HST is taken on top of the carbon tax. Yeah. They're literally taxing a tax. This is a tax on a tax that is a tax on business, on consumers, on care, on care for our most vulnerable seniors in long-term care, Speaker. It is a tax on everyone. It is a tax that is unfair. Speaker, once again, we call on the Liberals to do the reasonable thing. Call the Prime Minister. Tell them this is not a fair tax on our seniors. Let's get rid of this tax. Hey, hey, hey. Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning.